We're so thankful that you've joined us today for worship. And before we begin, just like normal, want to share a few updates with you. First of all, it was such a joy to be able to worship with many of you who came out for our outdoor service last week. So thank you for joining us outside. And I'm excited to remind you and tell you again that we will be having two Easter services, 915 and 11 o'clock Easter Sunday in the same spot under the beautiful oaks on our property. And we will have chairs for you. So don't worry, you don't have to bring a chair, um, but we'll be socially distant and just another unique opportunity to worship outdoors safely with one another and invite a friend. Already be thinking about who you can invite to join you on Easter Sunday for that joyous celebration. And then also want to remind you about the Seek service that's coming up this week, this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. And this week we have a unique opportunity to look at and understand fully what, how do our brains work and then how to seek healing for anxiety. So join us for that sweet night of worship and prayer and just a unique chance to look at our brains together. So friends, we're grateful that you've connected with us. And if we can serve you in any way, um, please let us know. And again, we're so grateful for your continued giving and your generosity. Friends, now let's enter into worship. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on Praises forever. 
those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity.
Hey friends, welcome wherever you are, whoever you are, if you're new to joining us. My name's AJ and it is such a joy to serve as the lead pastor here at St. Peter's Church. We are a people who believe that the greatest thing someone can do with their life is to follow Jesus. And no matter where you are on your story, whether you are at the beginning of your journey in Christ or you are somewhere in the middle, following Jesus is a daily thing. And so may you follow Jesus well and take the next step of what he's calling you into in your life because it matters. And so as we move toward confession, let's just create some space. If you're like me, we know that um, we're flawed and we don't get it right. Our motives are not always great. I like to say that life is a pie chart. There's a lot of good things, but there's also some slices of that pie that aren't quite as good and beautiful. And so um, what we know is that our God loves to hear us name and confess that which we know isn't good, true, and beautiful, and that God redeems and restores us back to fullness with him. So let's just invite God to come search our hearts and our minds. And God, we just confess whatever you're bringing to us right now, Holy Spirit, whatever you are imparting to us right now, we just confess that to you. We long to be um, made whole in you and with our neighbor. And so I pray that you would forgive us our sins. And so, Lord, even now we just repent and we seek to be fully restored to you. So, friends, join me in this prayer as we pray this. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We humbly repent. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us that we may honor you and walk in the way of Jesus. Amen. Friends, may you know the peace of Christ. It reigns. It's everywhere. It's in the atmosphere. So may you, um, may, may, may you receive that today. And so as we say every week, the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Our Gospel reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 5. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. 
Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hey everybody, good morning to you wherever you are. And before we dive in, first of all, those texts are so beautiful and I can't wait to get into those. But before we do, I wanna just give you a little preview about what is to come in the coming months here through teaching at St. Peter's. I have sensed recently in the seasons to come that we need to be deeper in the word. And so to that end, uh, we're gonna be studying 1 Peter a couple weeks after Easter. And we're gonna slowly work our way through that rich letter. And I'm so excited to dive into 1 Peter. There's so much in it that I think is gonna be really helpful for the moment that we find ourselves in. So look out for that. And if you have a desire this spring to host, uh, whether it's a small group or some sort of study, 1 Peter, a book study, whatever that is, we are longing to see more and more people come back together as we near hopefully the end of this pandemic and the weather is nice. So if that's a gift of yours, if you love bringing people together, you have gathering gifts, you'd love to host a small group, or if you are a teacher, you have a gift of teaching and you wanna do that in certain environments within our church, we're doing something, let me pull up a slide for you. It's called Calling All Leaders and Teachers. And it's gonna be on April 11th. I need you to RSVP to aj at stpeters.me. We're gonna spend an hour together at least on that afternoon. And if you can't make it, also RSVP to me and let me know you can't make it this time because I'm looking to find out who in our community loves the dynamic of getting together with people and either teaching or hosting, gathering people together for the sake of being on mission for Jesus, doing community, following Jesus in discipleship. So I look forward to that and hope you do too. That being said, let's move into the teaching for this week. We are in Lent and we continue on with this series that we're in called Deeper Still. And if you're just joining us, I wanna say welcome. Glad you're with us in this format. We've been in this Lenten series about deepening our intimacy with the living God, which is usually what we talk about when we talk about that. We think of getting more information about God, reading another book, going to another study, taking a course, and that's not bad. But when it comes to cultivating deeper intimacy with God, you can't actually do that without simply creating space and time to be with God. That prayer is a central function of what it means to relate, just like conversation is for the people around you, prayer is with the living God. And so we began in the first week with the idea of noise. And in the pandemic, I know a lot of external noise around us like traffic and um, maybe work schedules or whatever was going on, um, that kind of dissipated a little bit, but we noticed that the internal noise within us in the form of anxiety and fear and stress, all of that like came even higher. And many of us have said like, it seems like the internal noise within us has never been higher. And that led into week two, where we looked at the central practice throughout the Hebrew scriptures with Israel and the New Testament scriptures with Jesus and then the early church, what we noticed is that being still is a central practice for the people of God. After that, last week, we looked at the concept of a word called room. This is a word that Jesus gives us from Matthew 6, where Jesus says that within our very bodies, there is an inner depth, a kind of inner room within us that God wants us to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the layers of who we are, of the profound mystery that God has created in you and in me, and to pray from that place of depth. And one of the things that we said last week is that no matter who you are, you are deeper than you think, that God has made you well, and God has created you for depth. Okay, so as we press into this week, let me step back for a second. I wanna ask you three questions. And these are three questions that John Eldridge recently posed in his latest book, Get Your Life Back. One of the questions is this, would others describe you as lighthearted this season? Would others describe you as lighthearted this season? Number two, are you hopeful about the future? Generally, are you hopeful about where your life is headed, where the world is headed? Number three, when was the last time you felt carefree? When was the last time you felt carefree? So if you would answer these questions with any degree of sadness, then most likely anxiety is at work, somewhere in your life. 
And I'm not saying that's wrong. We're just saying that is, and we need to name that, that anxiety is a part of life. And anxiety, if it's not kept at bay, kept in check, it is such a joy killer. And it can rob us, even in the midst of our trials, where joy can be available, if you read the letter of James, that even in the midst of trials, joy can become available, but we got to figure out what to do with our anxiety. And here's what I notice about a lot of the anxiety that I hold. I notice that much of the things that I hold when I'm anxious, a lot of the things when I'm anxious that I'm holding are things that are beyond my control. And Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount actually talks a pretty good deal about anxiety. He talks about anxious hearts, anxious thoughts. And of all creation, get this, he uses a bird as an illustration. When you think about Jesus walking around, pulling examples, pulling metaphors, pulling symbols, he's in this profound moment in the book of Matthew, and he talks about birds when he wants to talk about anxiety. So Matthew chapter 5, turn with me there if you have your scriptures. I'll also put it on the screen in case you don't. And it reads this, Therefore I tell you, Do not worry about your life. I like to personalize this. It's like God saying to me, Jesus saying to me, listen, AJ, I tell you, do not worry about your life, AJ. I need to hear this. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Now listen to this. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I didn't notice it until this week, but it occurred to me that the world doesn't suffer from a shortage of birds. It just doesn't. I mean, I don't don't care where you live. You can usually find a bird or two somewhere singing or flying around you somewhere. They're everywhere. And so everywhere that you walk in this season, Everywhere that I'm walking, I'm like hearing birds again for the first time. I'm seeing birds. And it's just been a reminder to pray this simple prayer that John Eldridge gives in that book, uh, Get Your Life Back. When I hear birds singing, I think this prayer, God, I give you everyone and everything. It's almost like Jesus uses the birds as a metaphor, not only because they don't have worries and they trust God, but because they're everywhere to remind us of how we're supposed to be. So like every time I see a bird right now, I'm just reminded when I hear one, when I see one, it's God, I give you everyone and everything. God, I give you everyone and everything. A place to put my anxiety. And what's so incredible is that Jesus actually wants you to give your anxieties to him. He doesn't shame us for our anxieties. He doesn't tell us they're a problem. He says, give them to me. I will take them from you so that you can be set free. That anxiety isn't something new. Even in our Exodus reading today, I don't know if you caught the end of that. Israel's super anxious. And what's crazy is that God has just delivered them from Pharaoh with all of the miracles that came out of the seven signs from the seven plagues that happened with Pharaoh in Egypt. He's doing all these profound signs showing Israel, I got you, you're my people. And what's nuts about that is they don't get but a few days into the wilderness and they're already maybe like me, maybe like you, questioning God. Is God gonna come through for us? Can we trust God? And he's already done these incredible things. And here's the instruction that Moses gives to Israel. He says this, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That is such a convicting word. That AJ, all of the anxiety, all the things you think you control that are beyond your control, let the Lord fight for you. Give God the things you're holding on to and be still and watch what God will do. And so I think the application for me is that maybe it's true that the same Lord who fought for Israel will also fight for you. You just need to be still. What a great word, what a hard word. And so today we lean into another word. And it's a strange word, it's a weird word. And it comes to us from Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. And it's the word groans. In the Greek, it's the word stenogmois. 
And you've probably never heard a sermon on this word because it's super mysterious. And we kind of gloss over it. Like, I don't even know what that means, that creation groans, that we groan, that the spirit of the living God inside of his growing and here or groaning. And here's what it says in Romans 8. We do not know for what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Okay, so last week, Jesus says to go into your room and pray, to go into the inner room that God has made you where your soul dwells. And what's amazing about this is that Paul is saying that when you go to that inner room, when you don't just listen and live from the surface parts of your life and your desires, when you go into the deeper longings of your soul, what you will find is that there is a presence that is already there called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, from the depth of your being, according to Paul, groans within you. According to Scripture, when anyone surrenders their life to the Lordship of Jesus, what happens is that surrender, it opens up our capacity to receive the Holy Spirit who comes and makes a home, a room in the deepest parts of our body. And God, the Spirit, check this out, communes through groans from inside your body with God the Father and the Son who are outside your body. Do you get that? The presence of Christ in the Spirit within you is communing with the Father and the Son outside your body. And that means that you are connected with the flow and conversation of the Trinity itself, that you are brought into union with the triune God. That's crazy. It's so bizarre, it's so nuts, it's so hard to even believe. And Paul is saying that that is what is happening to someone that follows Jesus. Author Marjorie Thompson, she once wrote, have you ever considered what an astonishing promise it is that the Spirit prays in us and does so according to the will of God? Perhaps our real task in prayer, now check this out, Our real task is to attune ourselves to the conversation already going on deep in our hearts. Then then we may align our intentions with the desire of God expressed at our core. Okay, let's just think about this for a second because you're not careful this is gonna go way over the head and be like, what are we talking about? Let me just simplify this. Let's think about prayer for a second. What if prayer isn't really about you starting a conversation with God? Right, like I'm gonna go over there, I'm gonna pray to God, God's gonna hear me. That's true, I'm not saying that's untrue. But what if prayer is deeper than that? What if prayer isn't about you starting and stopping a conversation with God? What if prayer is about you joining a conversation that God is already having? It's crazy. It's like, like my mind blows when I think that prayer isn't about me launching into a conversation, although, I think I'm welcome to with God. Prayer is about me saying, since the beginning of time, God and Father, Son, and Spirit have been having a conversation. By the way, God spoke the word into existence, spoke the world into existence, that God has been speaking to God, God the Father, to God the Son, to God the Spirit. They have been in a conversation and we have been invited into that conversation. And that is prayer. It's joining the conversation God has been having. Have you ever rocked up to a conversation at a party in a neighborhood with some friends or at work and you've rocked up to the conversation and it's been clearly evident to you that you've not been invited? Like you walk into it, you kind of stumble into it and you're like, whoa, okay, I think I'm just gonna like quietly see myself out of this conversation, right? If you know that, if you've experienced that, that's the exact opposite of our God. 
Our God does the exact opposite of that. It's almost like God is saying, I'm constantly wanting to invite you into what I'm doing in the conversation that I am having about where the world is headed and how I am the Lord over all of it if you will just be still. There's this beautiful icon by a Russian iconographer named Andrei Rublev that I've shown before in my teaching here at St. Peter's. And it, it's, it's, it always comes back to me in my story. I'll put it on the screen for you. And what's beautiful about this is you see the depiction of what I see as the Trinity and they're gathered around the table. And what I love about this is that there's always an opening for you and for me to join, to pull up a seat. That the conversation that the Trinity is having, God is constantly saying, come join us, come sit with us, come be with us in relationship at the triune table. That we are always welcome at God's table. It's absolutely incredible. Okay, so about a decade ago, I was uh, doing my doctorate program and I had the opportunity to spend a week uh, in the home learning from a Franciscan monk named Richard Rohr out in New Mexico. And so my program alerted me, hey, listen, if you want a couple extra hours of credit, you can go out early, fly out to Santa Fe, and you can earn additional course credit if you attend this conference that he's hosting on prayer. And I'm like, sure, I'm in for a few extra credit. Get that out of the way and continue to just kind of absorb my program as quickly as I can. And so I get to this conference center and it's packed. It's not what I expected on a conference on prayer. I mean, the place is absolutely packed. There's probably a thousand people. Remember those days when we would jam into rooms? Like a thousand people crammed into this conference room. And I'm probably the last one to get there and I find the only remaining chair available. I take out my computer and I realize like the wisdom coming from the stage from these people was just like gushing. And I was like, oh, I've got to capture this wisdom and use for my paper. So I get at my computer and I'm just like going to town on my keyboard and I cannot get like the words that are coming out, I can't get into my Word document fast enough. And all of a sudden I feel this tap on my shoulder just this tap, tap, tap. And I'm like, what, what is that, right? So I, I turn around and there's this woman who leans in from behind me and she whispers. She goes, can you stop typing? It's really distracting. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. So I close my computer and I look around all of these people at this conference and I realize I am the only one under the age of 70. And I begin to think, well, A, who invited me to the party? And B, what is this place? Like, what have I, what have I entered into here in this conference? And so at the lunch break, I started to get really curious about this of like, I, I wanna know why everyone here is so much older than me. I'm the only one not collecting social security. Like, what, what, why am I here? Why are you here? And so I begin to ask that question to people I run into at lunch. And it, it basically came down to this. People were saying a similar thing, such as this, that we've spent our whole lives learning more information about God. And we've discovered that what we want most now is to encounter Him. That information isn't the same as encountering the God who lives in the core of your being according to the scripture. And that as you age, I think the sort of takeaway for me, the commentary I made up about that, is that as you get older, you eventually come to a place where you've just sort of heard it all. You've heard all the spiritual gimmicks, the, the latest trends, the latest book, the fad. You've taken the new job, you've tried out the new promotion, the cooler church, the next sort of pay increase or whatever. Like you've, you've experienced a lot of things up until now, and you've noticed that none of them have actually satisfied the deepest longings in the human heart. They were all part of your journey, but they're not fulfilling like you thought maybe they would be. And that there's only one thing in the universe that can truly satisfy our deepest longings, and that's meeting with the living God. There's this Hebrew scholar named Dwight Pryor who says it well, don't miss this, this is really beautiful. You'll come into fullness 
of who you are. I love that fullness. I mean, isn't that what we long for? You'll come into fullness of who you are when you recognize that there is another who lives within you. And that is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. If, if you miss this, you miss the, the sort of reason this story was given to us. The whole, the whole of the Bible, Colossians 1, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And what is the mystery? It's Christ in you. Not Christ around you, not Christ out there. The mystery of the story of God is that through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension has sent the Spirit that the Son of God, the Spirit of Christ, would come into our hearts, into the deepest room, who is the hope of glory. Verse 28, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone, here it is, fully mature in Christ. Listen, maturity in Christ doesn't come from the next book, the next conference, the next trend, the cooler church. Maturity in Christ comes from attending the presence of Christ who lives within you. That's the mystery. I'll close with this. Here's two words I'll put on the screen. What do these two words have in common? Listen. Silent. Listen. Silent. What do they have in common? You can't spell listen without using the same letters as silent. If we want to hear from God, we have to create space to be silent before the Lord. And what you'll find is that the living God is groaning inside of you, communing with the Father and with the Son and inviting you to the party. That's the meaning of Christianity, that you might become mature in Christ Jesus. Here's an application. This week, do you have a plan B, a plan where you can be with God? Do you have a plan B? Like what might that look like this week where you find yourself taking a walk with God, not with your iPhone, not with your podcast or your iTunes, not even with a good book, although those are amazing, just being with the Lord. Do you have a plan B where you can just listen to the God who lives in you? So next week, we're gonna close this series by looking one final step in order to deepen our intimacy with God. But let's stop for there. I think that's enough for today for us to consider. May you know that you're loved. And I just wanna pray over you wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever anxiety is in you. I hope to see you this coming Wednesday as we seek God through understanding what's happening in our brains this Wednesday night and how to quiet more of the anxiety. So Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would minister to my friends from within who they are already. For anyone listening to this who has never said yes to surrendering to Christ Jesus as Lord, may, may they know for the first time that that opens up their soul for the flow of the Spirit of God to come into them and to revive and renew them from within. So may there be hearts all over the low country and beyond right now that are opening themselves up more to Jesus, that we might experience more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you, my friends.
as we close our time in worship today, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for joining us week after week online. And want to share the scripture out of Hebrews that I've been sitting in um, this week. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. I'm just so grateful um, for the anchor that we have in Christ, that he holds us because he's faithful. And so I just pray this week, as we go into a new week, that we would hold to him, that we'd be reminded of how faithful he is, and that we also would continue to meet and show up for one another week after week, whether it's online or in person, and just in face-to-face to encourage one another. So I pray that you would be able to do that this week for those around you and for those in our church community. And so as we close our time, let's pray the Lord's Prayer with one another. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, we hope you have a wonderful week. See you soon. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.